never really encountered the gospel at all um, growing up. We did a little bit of religious education at high school, but again, the Christianity I was brushed with was a kind of be a good boy, behave yourself, and then you'll go to heaven kind of thing. I just remember what stuck was that Jesus died. Like, cause I mean, that's talked about a lot, especially in Sunday school. You got the picture of him with the lambs and how he was the lamb that was slain. And, all. and I didn't necessarily know what it meant, but I did know that Jesus died for sinners so that they could be forgiven. My view of Jesus was kind of a cross between Gandhi and one of the Bee Gees. You know, he said sort of nice things, and in my head he had kind of long hair and nice teeth and that kind of stuff, but he was pretty bland. We live in culture that doesn't always honor God. And so that influences our views of Jesus on what he looked like, who he was, and even things that he said. One of the most prevalent ways that we see this today in our culture is through the issue of same-sex relationships and other topics pertaining to the LGBT community. We see different people in the church, we see different Christians changing their minds on what the Bible has to say about subjects dealing with sexuality like homosexuality. We see this within church leaders even, changing their whole paradigm where they believed in the traditional biblical view of marriage, they have now shifted. And usually it's because somebody they know and love comes out to them and they don't know how to handle it. Other times people stand so firmly in truth that they end up losing relationships with people that they love who identify as LGBT. And yet, I think there's another way, that we can hold firm to our biblical convictions and yet still love people at the same time, that we don't have to allow culture to impact our view of Jesus, and if we stand firm within grace and truth, then that guards against misconceptions about Jesus. I grew up in black church. That's like a no-no <laughs> is to be gay. And so it was projected all the time that this is not okay. But I had read the scriptures pertaining to it being a sin. And so I just believed it. I didn't try to talk myself out of it. Because to me, I felt like what I read in the scriptures was correlating with the conviction I felt. This feeling correlates with what this is saying. <laughs> it's like, it's not an isolated situation. But I still didn't know how to come to terms with, this is how I feel, so I'm gonna do it. Then I think of 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul lists a set amount of sins, idolatry, homosexuality, slanders, murderers, none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. It, it equates this specific topic to sin as, as, a, as a breaking of God's law. We see in the Old Testament in Leviticus, I think it's 1822 and Romans 126 to 27, it calls it unnatural. That's a hard truth 
That's a difficult thing to say that who you want to love is wrong. That sounds absurd in this culture. And I think it sounds crazy when you don't consider who it is that's saying it. We don't want to be creatures. We want to be creators. We want to be autonomous in a sense. We want to control ourselves. And I think that if he created us, that means he has an intention and a purpose and an order. But if you don't see God as absolute joy and happiness and truth and peace, then you'll think that's foolish. There's a kind of thing that keeps trending these days that Jesus never addressed homosexuality, therefore he must have been fine with it, therefore we should be fine with it too. But actually, Jesus was very clear that any sex outside of marriage is, is a sin. He makes that clear in Matthew 15. And then in Matthew 19, again, he, he defines marriage as being between a man and a woman being made one flesh, and that that being a lifelong union. And so even if we didn't have Leviticus and Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 in the Bible, we would still know what to think about homosexuality. There was a time when you and Sarah were thinking about maybe we'll get married. Mm -hmm. And so we had the conversation about, you know, what could we do? How can we work it out to honor your faith and convictions if we do get married and also honor what we want? Yeah, I just really respect that you and Sarah at that time were even interested in dialoguing about what you might do. I was 17, I was at a high school dance. This girl I knew from middle school, she came up to me and like flirted with me, pretty much suggested that we should be in a relationship. You know, if she's, if she's willing to take the risk to hit on you, were you like sending a vibe that you Everybody thought I was gay. They thought I was gay because I'm, I'm not a girly girl. I'm still not, I don't wear purses, I don't, I don't like them. And so because of that, because I, I looked like a tomboy, I acted like a tomboy, they immediately correlated that with being homosexual. I responded as if I was offended, but I went home and I started to wrestle with the fact that this would be my opportunity to act out on how I had been feeling. I liked her coming on to me and wanted to pursue that. And so what she said to me was just like, okay, either I try it or I don't. So I pursued it and that's started everything. I remember going to a gay pride parade, I think it was 2007. There was this booth where they were giving out stickers and pamphlets and buttons that said, gay by God. You got people with their kids, gay by God, flags, gay by God. And I remember feeling like that's not, that's not right. But I can't communicate that because it's like, how are you gonna say that's not right and that's what you're doing? And so it was more so like something I just put in the back of my mind that really would convict me like, God, I don't think you're okay with this. But if you're not okay with this, then you're not okay with me. <laughs> I don't really feel like the LGBT community is like asking for special treatment. I think they're just asking to be treated with respect and have the same rights as other people. When it comes to like servicing in a restaurant, or denying someone housing, especially, you know, in public places. Really, you can't serve me food, you know? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't really, it's just. Do you feel like that happens a lot? Uh, I think they're, well, they're creating legislation that allows for that. And I don't quite understand that level of fear. I okay, and I agree with what you. That's rooted in. Yeah, it is. It's based in fear and the fear of change. And we're all in a place where the culture is dramatically shifting and we have a tremendous fear of the unknown. You're called to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. And so if we're fulfilling that calling, we should be doing a much better job. And it's when people are so terrified of the fear of the unknown and they begin to act upon what they don't know because it's also new to them, things get really hairy and hard and hurtful. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think everybody should be entitled to their, to their beliefs, to, their, to make their own choices. If a you know, lesbian couple comes to you and says, we would like you to film our wedding, you should be able to have the opportunity to say, you know what, that's not something I can do because of my beliefs. And if I were that lesbian couple, I wouldn't really want you to film my wedding because mm -hmm. you wouldn't really be able to capture what it is I'm looking to capture. But this is Sue Happy America. I, I'm now a victim, so I'm going to sue you. I think we both feel the same way, which is it Absolutely. is so over politicized that it's shameful. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, embarrassing. it's embarrassing. To box all trans people in 
as, a, as the problem. It's just a really, it's a really bad and dangerous narrative. Not too long ago, I was talking with a friend of mine. My friend is affirming of same-sex relationships, and he knows that I am not. And we were talking about this whole subject, and we landed on Romans chapter 1. In verse 26, out of all the verses, th this is just the key part of this whole passage. And here's what the Apostle Paul writes. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. He said, you know, the word natural there is referring to whatever is natural for the one committing the act. So if it's natural for somebody who is same-sex attracted to be in an intimate relationship with somebody of the same gender, that's natural. It would be unnatural for them to be in a heterosexual relationship. I realize that that's not what it's referring to at all. It's talking about God's created order. It's going back to what Paul referred to in Romans 1, 18 through 21. It's doing the same thing that Jesus did, appealing back to God's original created order, appealing back to the truth of how God structured intimacy, sexuality, not only for our own personal lives, but also for use in our society. Because here's the truth, and it's hard for some people to believe, but God designed sexual intimacy to be expressed in marriage between one man and one woman, and anything outside of that box is not part of God's design. God actually calls it a sin. And throughout the scriptures, the Old and the New Testament, amongst all the different writers, there is agreement that there is a male-female relationship, even in the most messed up relationships in the Bible. There are some family trees you do not want to crawl around in, but it was always a male and female relationship. I remember distinctly going to what my church called encounters. They would have literally a time of casting out demons. The pastor stood at the front of the auditorium and he said, everybody stay in your seats. We're gonna begin the um, essentially exorcism process now. And he began naming spirits that he would cast out of us. People around me started crying and convulsing and falling over. He named the spirit of homosexuality, I cast you out. Nothing happened to me. I, I didn't really move. I was just kind of looking around. Afterwards, I, I went and I talked to my friend, and I said, uh, you know, I didn't, I don't feel like anything changed. I don't feel like anything's different with me. You know, I don't feel like that part of me is gone. And he was like, well, I guess you didn't believe enough. It, it, was, it was very confusing and it was very, it was frightening. And I felt very, very much alone. As I began to study theology more, I began to look for loopholes in the scriptures. I began to look for things that would say, no, this practice is absolutely permissible. You know, that was just for that time. Here and now, of course, you can do as you please. And, and as long as you do it in love, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. God blesses it. It's false love. True love, according to the scriptures, is God in Christ on the cross. And when we start with that as our definition of love, then homosexuality doesn't factor in. He gives us a new expression of love, self-sacrifice, giving up that which we might want in the face of depression and anger and anguish and loneliness. I'm a real matter-of-fact person. I take stuff as it is. What does the text say? Deal with it. It's there. Like, I'm not gonna argue with it. It's, it's there. Like, this is unnatural. Men with men, women with women. I think the extremes that people go to drives them crazy. That doesn't mean it was any less difficult, because it was really hard to be like, OK, so you're telling me to stop. This is a very temporary world. And so I think as people made in the image of God, we understand that we have souls. And we understand that, man, when I die, there is another place I am going. And I need to reckon with where and why. It was apparent to you throughout all the time that like, there's a God. Absolutely. Yeah, we could get go the Richard Dawkins route and all this type of stuff. If there's created things, there has to be a creator. So. You find
find these teachers today who try and rationalize Christianity with a homosexual lifestyle, and they end up doing violence to all of these texts of scripture. You've got to go against the grain of so much in the Bible to justify same-sex relationships. It's not just a, a few kind of piecemeal verses here and there that could go either way. What captivates me is the, the beauty of the biblical vision for marriage. The Bible begins with a marriage and it ends with a marriage. It begins with, with Adam and Eve in the garden. It ends with Christ and the church in the new creation. The biblical vision of marriage is so beautiful precisely because it's the big thing that God is doing in the world, informing a people for his son. And therefore, if you, if you muck around with your understanding of marriage, you muck around with the gospel. You lose Christianity very, very quickly when you do that. Let God be true and every other man be a liar is essentially the response that I have to give. The things I knew about scripture, it seemed like they just would not get out of my head. It was just like, God is everywhere. And it was just getting on my nerves. I don't wanna be a Christian. I don't wanna be saved. Because what I thought Christianity to be was people that just didn't do stuff. You don't listen to secular music, you wear long dresses, you go to church all the time, and you don't curse. If that's what Christianity is, I'm cool on that. I already didn't have peace, but the reminder of the truth was increasing my awareness of my lack of peace. And so I called uh, one of my cousins who was a believer, and she was like, you know what, I believe that God is going to show you how much you need him. I'm like, okay, whatever. I think over the course of some months, that's when I got arrested. My dad ended up passing away from a motorcycle accident, which really broke me because it was kind of like this realization that we'll never talk. From there, me and my mother's relationship was just like, we were not close, we were not cool. It was like everything I was doing, my entire life became uncomfortable. It became isolated, it became just lonely. When I was 19 and feeling God speak to my heart and tell me what you're doing will be the death of you. Like this is not an idea anymore that sin will kill me. It's not an idea anymore that God is not pleased with this. Like this is reality and I have to deal with it today. When I reckoned with that, I knew that I could not save myself. I knew I could not walk away from these things because I enjoyed them way too much. And so I knew from Bible study at church when I was five, you die for people like me. You said you'll forgive people like me. And so I'll just believe that. I was in a church in two weeks wearing girl clothes in a week. That was strange. I wasn't used to wearing regular bras and I had to understand how to sit like a woman again because I was used to sitting like a guy. Just relearning womanness. He did what he had to do to grab me, because I would not have chose God apart from God choosing me. When I wake up, new mercies meet me, two hearses greet me. They search me with an urgency, we see deep like seaweed. Body bending is cursive, this worship is rehearsal. It's universal, who you work through. The church's purpose is to search you. It's a process when I'm watching the rock and this promise. Must be honest, it's some blinders, it's time and my progress. Um, then I remember. Make us happy when we look at you. Can make us happy when we look for you. Satisfaction only happens to those who look glad in you, glad in you. Can make us happy when we look at you. Can make us happy when we look for you. Satisfaction only happens to those. When I was, let's see, about 40 years old, I've been trying to figure this out for all that time, right? And then during that time, I had a serious problem with chin with any alcohol. A colleague who I've been working with, she called me. I'm going to be taking a month vacation. When I come back, I will no longer be known as by this name. Mm. I'll be known as Jessica. And she was a VP in a company. And it was like the first time the light bulb turned on that you can actually live your life like this. 41, I started buying hormones from Brazil, which is very dangerous. It's mm -hmm. not something anybody should do. Then I quit drinking. That was it. I'd made the decision at that point. Margaret came over and we were in the basement and, and I was horrified because I knew, you know, I knew Margaret's convictions, her faith, and I loved her. <laughs> and I didn't want to lose that, you know, so. But I couldn't, 
it was done, you know? It was like, I was either gonna move forward or I was never gonna live. I was tired of denying myself. I was tired of hiding. I was tired of living with guilt and shame that didn't need to be there, you know? I never really had the opportunity to explore a homosexual lifestyle. I became a Christian just at the point where I might have begun to have done so. Built into my understanding from the very beginning of my Christian life was the sense that Jesus comes first and self comes second. And therefore, I would have to deny myself and take up my cross if I was to follow him. Not really knowing what that would look like in practice, but knowing that that was what I was signing up for in following him. A verse that has really been a kind of foundational one for me is when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Bread in the time of Jesus was a staple food. Without bread, you died. And Jesus is saying, there is no earthly relationship that can satisfy us at the level that he can. He is what our souls were made for. One of the things that I wrestled with, which was really an emotional upheaval, is the fact that I was never born female, biologically, from the get-go female. For me, there, would have, there could have been that, that always that chasing, I need to be a little bit more complete. My breasts aren't big enough. My <laughs> hips aren't big enough. My, you know, whatever the case may be. I can't continue to search for things external to make me feel whole. And what I didn't want to get into was that rut where I'm never satisfied. When you first brought up um, having the surgery and Sarah was with us, and I remember her saying to you, you do understand that no matter what you do, you're not going to have children, you know, you're not going to be a woman in that way. And she said it's so important for you to understand and accept that aspect of your new identity. And if you can't, then you are going to really have problems. Yeah. And I remember her explaining that up. So she explained that just it was so clear. Yeah. And you were at that time just like, I, I do. I mean, yeah, I, I, I understand it. Yeah. I get asked this question a lot. What's the big deal? So what if somebody is with somebody of the same gender? Who cares as long as they're not hurting anybody and if that person's happy, who cares? Sometimes we see God as a cosmic killjoy. We think that God doesn't want us to have any fun in life. We think that God has set up these boundaries and there's no reason for these boundaries whatsoever. But if you're a parent, you know that there are boundaries that you have put up for your kids. And some of the times your kids are not gonna understand why those boundaries are there, but you put up those boundaries because you know what would happen if they cross the boundaries. Now, in that child's immediate mind, they don't know what will happen if they cross this certain boundary, but you know because you've been there and you have experience. You see, God is outside of time. God can see the past, the present, and the future perfectly. He is all knowing, He is all powerful, He is all present, He is timeless and eternal. God knows what will happen, and the boundaries that God has put in place, we need to pay attention to, because while we are concerned about immediate gratification, God is concerned about the whole picture, and we can't see the whole picture. And if we look at sex and intimacy for our immediate gratification, no matter how we feel about it, then sex and intimacy within our society can very easily become manipulative and selfish and damaging to other people. And while it may not seem like a big deal today, what about 200 years from now? What about 300 years from now? What will it look like then? God sees the big picture. Jesus also had very deep relationships with people who were not like him, people who were far away from God, but he never allowed those relationships to compromise what he had to say about the truth. Can you not? What? Is your hope for Carly that she'll continue to grow in Christ? Of course. <laughs> I, would be, I, would be, I would be just lying if I didn't say that. Of course, that's my hope. That is my hope, of course. Yeah, because that's the Do you know way. how many times I've heard this? Oh, I'm, it's never going away. <laughs> and it's I, you know, and I, and, I, and I feel like I do. I just don't talk about it the same way. I've always said that. Maybe that's my own work that I've got to do still, but. Yeah, and I think for us to understand 
I said, you know, if you look at your life on a continuum where at one end is denying this transition for the sake of Ben, and at the other end is completely going after and making this transition despite Ben, you know, I would want you to err on not doing it for Ben's sake. Where would you find yourself on the continuum? And Carly said, right in the middle. And that to me is the place of lukewarm. I'm a person who either lives over here, you know, death to self, uh, or I'm going to live completely selfishly. So, you know, we just need to continue to dialogue and evidence to each other in our own lives, what does that look like? That's what I would hope for, for both of us, is to be able to do that well, yeah.